Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Roberto Maregaro. And uh, today, I'm uh, honored to introduce you Dr. Lorenzo Olivieri from the Center for uh, Space Activities, Jesus, uh, from the University of Padua in Italy. Last week, uh, we had um, Professor Emeritus Storbieri. And uh, with just uh, one week uh, after, uh, we have here Dr. Olivieri. This is due to the different timelines of other projects we are uh, um, carrying out here for the aerospace program. And uh, we did the start of the new master in aerospace engineering. Uh, with Dr. Lorenzo Olivieri, we share uh, many projects that uh, we did uh, together. Some of them will be mentioned today. The first one was a uh, space mission at the Eisen Space Center in uh, Sweden, in Kiruna, that we will also mention now a bunch of years uh, past about it. And um, now uh, we were here at Amcast. We are uh, developing research about uh, hypervelocity impacts, studies of space debris, applications to the outer space. Uh, Field, so aeronautical applications, studies of uh, materials, and also um, you can see a brochure one on uh, its table. We are co-editors for a special issue of uh, scientific journal uh, Applied Sciences, a special issue about uh, space debris. And uh, um, so some of you are uh, too young still to submit uh, a paper about it, but uh, so you know colleagues you want uh, to share this uh, uh, the deadline for the application uh, for this special issue will be at the end uh, of, uh, of January. Uh, what else? Uh, so <laughs> now probably I will uh, um, at the end uh, I will uh, comment with uh, other important things we are uh, um, working on at the moment. Last uh, comment is that uh, uh, Dr. Olivieri uh, in here thanks to uh, funds from uh, a research project in Palma. And uh, in parallel, since we are working on, on a lot of things, is also the team of uh, Professor Alessandro Francesconi, which is uh, the responsible for the University of Padova for a project that uh, um, uh, we were, which uh, and was awarded. Uh, the IFAS Plus from uh, MCST, and uh, it is about the development of a single stage uh, at the SCAN facility to test the materials uh, here in Malta, and this will be the first facility of uh, this type uh, in, uh, in this country. So now I leave the stage uh, to Lorenzo, and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Donaldo. I'm really honored to be here in front of this audience, both with uh, students and professionals. And uh, uh, today I will try to give you some, uh, some ideas of the activities uh, on uh, space debris impacts that uh, are currently going on, and in particular the activities we are performing at the University of Padova and in collaboration with uh, this uh, institution. So, uh, I'll start with uh, something about myself, uh, some, uh, some information. I graduated uh, in uh, aerospace engineering uh, at the University of Padova, uh, and after that I got, uh, over the, uh, got there my PhD in uh, space sciences and technologies. Uh, during my PhD I worked uh, on uh, small satellites, uh, and uh, in that period uh, I got the opportunity to visit uh, MIT as a visiting student uh, for a couple of months. Uh, during uh, my studying, uh, I was able to participate uh, to uh, two ESA projects that allowed uh, me to participate to small real space missions. And thanks to that uh, experience, uh, I proposed to the University of Padova and to ESA the possibility to organize a symposium. This was uh, the first idea of the first symposium on space education activities that was uh, in Padova in 2015. Now we are at the fourth edition that will be in uh, Barcelona next, uh, next spring. Uh, 
Uh, and the symposium is uh, a showcase of all the students' activities related uh, to space uh, and aerospace uh, and uh, about the education uh, and uh, the opportunities uh, for uh, students uh, and for academics. Uh, again, something about myself. Uh, nowadays, in the, last, uh, in the last few years, uh, I'm a postdoc working on space debris, in particular on uh, protection and remediation, but uh, uh, when I have time, I'm still working on uh, small satellites docking. Uh, thanks to the opportunities gave to me by this uh, postdoc, I was uh, the member to the Italian Space Agency delegation to uh, the in Interagency Debris Committee in Tokyo 2018, responsible for the working group free on protection. And now I'm, uh, as uh, Leonardo previously mentioned, I'm a co-editor of a special issue of an important scientific journal. This special issue is dedicated to space debris. Last uh, thing about myself, then I go to the more interesting uh, topics of the day. Uh, I'm part of, I was part of uh, two uh, H2020 research projects uh, supported by the European Commission. The first uh, was a Redshift that uh, focused on uh, new technologies and new materials for the aerospace, uh, in particular for the orbiting and disposal of satellites. And uh, in this context, uh, the University of Padova uh, focused on uh, the development of uh, 3D printed uh, protections and on the test uh, of them with our hypervelocity impact facility. The other project is called ETIPAC. Uh, ETIPAC is a novel uh, system to the orbit satellites when they are at the end of their life. And uh, with the University of Padova, we are working on uh, the strategies to deploy a long tether in space and to design the mechanism to unreal, uh, unreal it. So here you can see the contest, uh, contents of this uh, presentation. First, uh, I will introduce you my research center, uh, CISAS. Then we will have three main uh, points. Uh, first, there will be uh, an overview on space debris. Then uh, I will uh, introduce you the impact uh, of uh, space debris research on the aerospace sector. And the last, uh, there will be a fast review of some uh, research activities uh, in uh, my center. The Center for Space uh, Studies and Activities, CISAS, uh, was born uh, in 1991 uh, in Padova by an idea of uh, a group of scientists that uh, worked on uh, space uh, topics. Uh, the name uh, Giuseppe Colombo name, uh, came from Professor Giuseppe Colombo that was uh, an important scientist and mathematician of the University of Padova. He is uh, quite famous. Uh, he collaborated with uh, NASA to develop uh, trajectories for uh, uh, reaching Mercury with the Mariner 10 uh, mission and uh, he gave also a significant contribution to the study of, of Saturn. If you uh, look to the Saturn uh, rings, there is a gap between the rings that is called the uh, Colombo gap because uh, he discovered the, the gravitational resonances that uh, create uh, this, uh, this gap between the rings. And also he is famous for the development of the space tethers. Uh, in our center, the research activities uh, are on uh, focus on uh, all the main fields of space sciences, from uh, astronomy and astrophysics uh, to planetary science, uh, geology, and uh, exploration of uh, planets, uh, space geodesy, and also uh, all the fields uh, related to space engineering, so space systems, space navigation, propulsion, and instrumentations. Uh, my center was also involved uh, in uh, many international uh, missions uh, like uh, ExoMars, uh, Baby Colombo, and uh, Juice. The overview of the last few missions uh, we participated to, my colleagues, uh, colleagues were able to work on the DREAMS sensor on board the Schiaparelli lander of the ExoMars 2016 uh, mission. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, uh, developed uh, the cover mechanism uh, for the Janus telescope that will be launched uh, in the next few years uh, to reach uh, uh, Jupiter and uh, explore the, the icy moons of, uh, of Jupiter. Uh, there were works uh, related uh, to the mission Bepi Colombo with a stereo camera developed uh, by the University of Padova. And also uh, the mission uh, Rosetta to explore a huge comet uh, in, uh, in 
was uh, uh, had a contribution from uh, the University of Padua, from Jesus, uh, with the development of uh, two cameras, the wide angle camera and the Osiris camera. We also work uh, on uh, balloons, uh, stratospheric balloons. Uh, the research is performed in collaboration with the Department of Industrial and Engineering. Uh, all those activities uh, started uh, with uh, this first experiment that was, uh, was called the SCRAT. SCRAT was, uh, for me, the beginning of my adventure in the space sector. And uh, it was a, I was a student, uh, and uh, it was a group uh, of students that participated to this project uh, supported by the European Space Agency. This was the chance for me to know Professor uh, Dr. Badilaro. <laughs> now, with Leonardo, we spend uh, many times uh, together. We are working on this group, uh, with this group on this experiment. We were able uh, to go to Sweden and launch our experiment uh, uh, in uh, the stratosphere. From that, uh, there are other activities going on uh, at uh, my center. Here you can see some pictures from uh, past uh, missions uh, and uh, launches. For example, uh, the picture on, uh, on, the, on the left was from a flight we had uh, this, uh, this uh, summer with our experiment uh, from uh, Tuscany in Italy, and we were able to collect information on uh, light pollution. Uh, other activities uh, in my center are related to uh, drones. There are some programs going on here. It's just a, a fast overview of them. We have uh, projects for uh, uh, investigating light pollution or also air pollution. We have uh, a project for recovering uh, uh, UAVs in case of failure and uh, or and of uh, the onboard power. So this is an automatic system to recover the UAV. And we have a project to uh, develop a system to recover people buried under avalanches in uh, our mountains. Lastly, we have different laboratories at uh, CHISAS in collaboration with the, always with the Department of Industrial Engineering. Here is just a fast overview. We have a, a glass table with a module that is able to move on it uh, with the low friction. We have a laboratory for space propulsion, propulsion and uh, also from that laboratory, a startup uh, was born in the last few years. Uh, and we have also the hypervelocity impact facility that uh, I will describe later in the remainder of the presentation. Now uh, I go to the, the core of this presentation. Let's start uh, speaking about uh, space debris. When people uh, think uh, about space debris, most, uh, most of the times think about uh, the gravity movie by Quadon from 2013. This was a nice description of a catastrophic uh, contamination of the orbits uh, by space debris. Luckily, we are still not at this level of contamination by debris, but uh, space debris are still uh, dangerous. Here, there are some pictures of real uh, damages from uh, small uh, debris that impacted the spacecraft. You can see in the first picture uh, this bump on the solar panel of Sentinel-1A. Or also there were damages uh, on uh, the Canada arm on board the International Space Station and also on the cupola that uh, allows uh, astronauts uh, to take pictures and uh, see outside of the International Space Station. And uh, uh, space debris are really dangerous uh, for the exploration uh, of the near-Earth space. Uh, a definition of space debris is in, here slide, in this slide. Uh, where we go to space, uh, there are two kinds of uh, orbital uh, source of danger. There are the micrometeoroids that are natural and the space debris that are man-made uh, objects. If uh, the micrometeoroids are small but really fast, uh, space debris are bigger and they can reach velocities between 100 meters per second to 16 kilometers per second. 16 kilometers per second is quite a, a, a huge velocity. It's like uh, crossing the whole uh, island of Malta in a couple of seconds. Uh, it's, uh, it is uh, really dangerous to be hit uh, uh, with uh, space debris. Uh, their average density is uh, about uh, 2,700 because they are mostly made with aluminum launched with human-made objects. 
The number of space debris is uh, currently growing. Uh, we have a huge number of objects that are currently orbiting around the Earth. Because uh, since the beginning of the space year, the satellites that were launched were uh, uh, more that, uh, than uh, 6,000. Uh, and most of them are still in space and they are breaking apart. Now we, are, uh, we have uh, something like uh, uh, 34,000 objects uh, larger than 10 centimeters, so pretty big. We have uh, around 1 million uh, objects that are between 1 centimeter and 10 centimeters, and we have 128 million objects that uh, are from 1 millimeter to 1 centimeter. This is a huge number. The space uh, near Earth is big, but, but not big enough uh, for all those objects. Uh, for largest objects uh, and uh, heavy objects, uh, it is possible to avoid them because they are trapped. So uh, if, if there is information about uh, those objects uh, going to collide with an uh, uh, active satellite, there is the possibility to perform collision avoidance maneuvers. But for smaller objects, uh, they are not trackable, so uh, there are only predictions on the numbers of them, and uh, they, these objects can uh, create uh, huge damages on board the satellites and create uh, a total loss of mission, or at least the failure of some components inside of the satellite. And the only way to protect our satellite from uh, this kind of impacts is uh, passive shieldings. So, uh, the source of space debris uh, is uh, from many different uh, kinds of objects, uh, from uh, non-operational uh, spacecraft, uh, from fragments from impacts and explosions of old satellites in space, uh, or for example, also the paint on the spacecraft can be detached uh, due to the reaction with the active uh, particles in, the, in space, uh, and then uh, these uh, flakes uh, can uh, damage uh, other satellites. Uh, uh, but uh, one uh, huge uh, source of uh, space, uh, space debris are anti-satellite tests. Here I can show you a small video by ESA. In this video, you can see the, uh, the space debris that are currently known in space. Those are the objects uh, larger than one meter. You can see that uh, there are uh, two or three main uh, areas that are involved uh, with those uh, objects. There is the geostationary uh, orbit, that is the one uh, with uh, all uh, the spacecraft for telecommunication. And there is uh, the low Earth orbit where there are the uh, satellites near the Earth, uh, also for telecommunication, but not in geostationary. And uh, there are some, others, uh, some other orbits. Uh, now we should uh, pass to the next class. Uh, here it is. Uh, this is the 10 centimeter class. Uh, now you can see that uh, the number is increasing. Uh, there is uh, like uh, a, a shield uh, around uh, all the low Earth orbits. Uh, these objects are still uh, capable uh, to uh, destroy uh, a satellite uh, or at least uh, make it uh, fail, and uh, after an impact from a 10 centimeter object, probably no satellite would uh, survive with the energies involved in this kind of collisions. Also, you see that the orbits uh, in the geostationary just, just are more polluted. Now we will see the last class, uh, larger than one centimeter, and now you can see that uh, there is a huge hazard by this kind of objects. Now uh, there are also other ob objects that are uh, other orbits that are involved in this uh, problem. You can see uh, the orbits that are between the geostationary and the lower Earth orbit. That are uh, they are usually the orbits in which the GPS satellite uh, satellites are placed. So here you you got an idea of the number of objects currently in orbit. Uh, most uh, of the fragments that, uh, of space debris of, of satellites that are in orbit came uh, from main fragmentation events. The most important fragmentation event was a collision between two satellites. One was a satellite of the Iridium telecommunication uh, constellation, and another the other satellite was a Russian defunct uh, spacecraft. From that uh, huge collision, we were able to track from, uh, from ground 
uh, uh, more than 1,000 large uh, fragments, and the two debris cloud were created by this event. Another thing that caused the, the increase of the number of, uh, of space debris was the, the Chinese uh, anti-satellite test. Chinese uh, wanted to demonstrate the cap capability to uh, destroy a satellite, and uh, they fragmented with a missile one uh, meteorological satellite in a high altitude, uh, low Earth orbit. Uh, and this uh, was uh, a really bad uh, moment for uh, creating new space debris because the pollution uh, that was created by this uh, test was uh, pretty high. Later I will show you some pictures. Other anti-satellite tests were performed after the Chinese one uh, by the US and by India. Luckily, those tests were at a lower altitude, so the residual drag of the atmosphere was able to uh, remove most of the fragments and they are not creating any danger to active spacecraft. Here you can see the effect of the two, uh, collision, the, the two events I previously mentioned. The blue line was the number of uh, fragments uh, at, uh, in orbit. And uh, after the two events, uh, you see the red, uh, the, the red line, you can see that there are two, two big uh, peaks uh, that are caused by those uh, events. We got uh, more, we da more than doubled the number of, uh, of space debris in the two orbits involved uh, in those events. And this is quite dangerous because those two orbits are the most commonly used for satellites from Earth. They are these so-called synchronous orbits that are used for most telecom satellites and observation satellites. Uh, here are the two events, the Cosmos Iridium and the Feng yun one c uh, the big issue with space debris is that uh, we are launching uh, many satellites and the number of launches increases every year. Uh, and for higher orbits, uh, from uh, 1978, uh, there was a study by Donald Kessler that uh, he said uh, we have to pay attention to, to this problem because if we continue launching satellites, 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 sooner or later there will be some uh, huge impact creating uh, a large number of uh, space debris that will be able to hit uh, new satellites and going on with uh, a cascade effect. Something like, the, like what uh, you saw in the movie Gravity that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, this uh, scenario is called uh, the Kessler syndrome and uh, is uh, currently really worrying uh, the space community. Also because in the last years, uh, everyone is talking about large constellation. For example, for example the Starlink constellation for internet. Uh, SpaceX is launching thousands and thousands of satellites and they create a huge danger to the space debris. Uh, so for this reason, there, are, there is the interest on regulating the debris environment. Uh, so there are two different levels uh, of uh, ways uh, to uh, regulate the environment from international collaboration and from national laws to control the access to space. And uh, where there are issues, there are also opportunities. So in the last year, there is a growing of new uh, space enterprises for uh, the development of life extension services, the orbiting services, and the removal of all the dangerous objects that are currently in space. Uh, the most important uh, regulation uh, uh, opportunities given by the Interagency Debris Coordination Committee. That is a governmental forum that uh, for the world world coordinates the activities of all the space agencies that uh, are uh, worried about space debris. Uh, with this uh, organization, uh, we try to exchange information, uh, facilitate opportunities for cooperation, uh, and review the opportunities uh, and the progress uh, of the activities to uh, mitigate the space debris problem. Uh, this is uh, an important uh, uh, committee that was founded uh, in 1993. Uh, the Italian Space Agency uh, is member from 1998, 
and uh, uh, other uh, agencies are trying to collaborate. There is the first uh, period in which uh, uh, new members uh, are screened, and after that uh, they, became, they can become full members and participate to the, uh, each year to the activities uh, and the meetings of this uh, important uh, uh, committee. Uh, the EADC is uh, divided in uh, four groups plus the steering group that uh, manage, manage all the activities. There are uh, the experts in measuring uh, space debris, there are the experts in uh, uh, environment, so creating models. There, uh, there is the part of protection, so creating new shieldings uh, and testing them and simulating them. This is the part uh, we are working on uh, in Padova. And there is uh, the part of uh, mitigation. Uh, mitigation, so how to uh, deduce uh, the number of uh, debris, how they are created, uh, and how to remove them. Uh, as I said, uh, Chisas uh, is uh, my center is currently appointed by the Italian Space Agency as a representative of the group of protection. Uh, every year we present our activities, we participate to the meetings, and we give uh, to the Italian Space Agency uh, support to these, uh, these activities. Uh, in uh, this context, uh, CISAS uh, is performing uh, activities on uh, the protection, so testing and uh, creating new collaboration with new entities and new institutions in order to uh, prepare solutions to be presented at the EADC. Uh, the other side of the regulation is uh, the national laws and the legal frameworks. Uh, because there are uh, some international treaties that uh, define a uh, general framework for space access, but uh, some uh, national laws enforce uh, such treaties. The most important is the French Space Act, because uh, most of the activities performed in Europe are performed in the framework of the European Space Agency, and uh, most launches uh, are from uh, Kourou, that is uh, French territory in South America. So, uh, the French Space Act uh, is applied to all the launches from, so most of the launches from uh, Europe. And uh, in this uh, act, uh, that is, uh, it is clearly stated that satellites must be removed from orbit within 25 years of uh, mission completion. After they, they are dead, you have to remove them. And there are also other national laws, uh, for example, in Italy that are currently under discussion, and uh, uh, these are currently influencing the strategies on uh, new uh, space launches. Uh, as I said, there are also business opportunities. Uh, there are many projects by the European Commission, by ESA. These projects usually require international collaborations and uh, uh, collaboration between uh, academics uh, and uh, industrial uh, realities. Uh, also, large enterprises uh, are involved uh, in the development of strategies and uh, methods for active debris removal. And the small, uh, small uh, enterprises, small startups, uh, are entering in this field and are growing really fast due to the huge number of opportunities that uh, are arising in this context. Here you can see an example. This is uh, the proposal uh, from ESA of the first uh, space debris removal mission. ESA is uh, spending uh, a lot of funding on uh, developing solutions for uh, cleaning uh, space. And the Clear Space One will be the first uh, real mission to perform uh, active debris removal, so to remove objects from space. Uh, the idea is to remove uh, the so-called VESPA. VESPA is an adapter to launch satellites, uh, uh, to connect satellites to the rockets that uh, launch them to space. And usually those uh, adapters are left in space. So ESA wants uh, to demonstrate uh, that it is, uh, there is the possibility to remove them safely and uh, avoid uh, any issue with the creation of new space debris. Uh, now, why are space debris dangerous? I mentioned something before, but here we can see some of the effects of uh, space debris impacts on, uh, on spacecraft. Uh, when our spacecraft is in orbit and it is impacted by uh, a debris, uh, usually we cannot go on, uh, uh, recover the spacecraft and uh, do some maintenance and uh, uh, solve the problem. 
those are issues that uh, may cause the loss of the mission. Uh, here you can see some example of uh, small debris impacts uh, results. Uh, with the Sentinel-1A that I showed in one of the first slides, there was uh, this, this impact event that uh, caused the loss of the attitude control of the satellite for a certain time. This satellite is important because it is monitoring uh, the Earth, so it is checking uh, for emergencies if, if there are flo uh, floods or there are earthquakes. It uh, can give uh, fast access and information on the situation on the ground, and the losing it would be uh, a huge problem for uh, uh, civil protection and uh, rescue. Also, there is the problem in case of impacts of the deterioration of optics, thermal contour surfaces, or solar, solar panels. This is uh, one example of, uh, uh, from the Hubble's uh, solar arrays. Hubble was uh, one of the few uh, objects, satellites, that uh, we were able to do some maintenance on. The US uh, astronauts were able to reach it and uh, substitute uh, the solar arrays. And then studying them, we saw the effect of the impact of the space debris. This is probably a really, really, really small uh, object, like uh, less than one millimeter, that caused uh, this uh, damage. Uh, when a debris uh, impacts uh, a satellite, it can uh, penetrate external shieldings and create uh, internal damages from uh, losing uh, subsystems to losing power to losing a critical system. Uh, one example is the MSAT spacecraft that is uh, practically intact in orbit, but uh, we cannot uh, control it anymore. Uh, MSAT is a huge spacecraft. It is large uh, like uh, uh, two or three cars uh, altogether, and uh, it is orbiting uncontrolled uh, in uh, the 800 kilometers uh, orbit. That is one of the most polluted ones, and uh, so he is, uh, it is really dangerous uh, because if he uh, starts fragmenting, he could uh, uh, create uh, the complete loss of uh, this uh, this orbit. Uh, also, space debris may uh, penetrate uh, pressurized modules, like the modules on the International Space Station. Space station. Uh, for this reason, there is a continuous monitoring of the ESS with uh, inspections of uh, the external uh, shields. Uh, here uh, you can see a picture of a test of uh, an hypervelocity impact. Hypervelocity impacts can reach uh, high velocities. In uh, low Earth orbits, uh, the most uh, used orbits, uh, we can reach uh, up to 15 kilometers per second. Uh, in uh, geo orbits, uh, where there are the telecom satellites, for, for example, for TV, the impacts uh, are at uh, lower velocities between uh, 100 meters per second to 1 kilometer per second. Now there is a growing interest uh, also in those, uh, in those orbits, uh, and uh, we need uh, to find uh, new methods to investigate uh, these kind of impacts. When uh, there is an hypervelocity impact, uh, there, there are many physical effects that happen. The most uh, visible result is the creation of a huge uh, of a number uh, of fragments, huge number of fragments that create a debris cloud that is able to go and impact objects behind the component that is hit by the space debris. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, an hypervelocity impact, for a small aluminum sphere of one centimeter at uh, 10 kilometers per second, the energy of the impact is 75 kilojoule. This is equivalent of a medium class car impacting a wall at 50 kilometers per hour, or it is equivalent of the energy of a hand bomb. And all this energy in a small object like an aluminum sphere. So, uh, let's go to the second part of this presentation. The impact of uh, space debris research on the aerospace uh, sector. Uh, working on space debris uh, requires us to find uh, some solutions to mitigate uh, the problem of debris collisions. One of the first uh, technical solutions is, of course, uh, observing, tracking, and monitoring the space debris. For this region, this one, there is uh, on ground a network of uh, telescopes, and there are also space system, space observatories that are used for tracking uh, all the objects that are in the lower orbits. 
uh, we are able from the ground to see objects up to one centimeter, twelve centimeter uh, in the first section. And uh, uh, thanks to this uh, network, uh, we are able to monitor and have information on potential collisions. Uh, potential collisions. Uh, there are many analogies uh, in this field uh, with eye uh, traffic control, but still uh, we are missing some uh, parts uh, like regulation procedures and the legal framework in case of impacts. If my satellite is going to impact uh, your satellite, who, uh, who is the fault? Who is paying? Who is going to, uh, this, uh, to solve the problem? The, this legal framework is still open and there are investigations going on, the, going on on this topic. Uh, in the last years, there is also a growing interest in the so-called space situational awareness. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, a trending topic for research opportunities and for funding in, uh, in international collaborations because uh, there is uh, this, this uh, desire to uh, create the coordination with uh, all the entities tracking and controlling the space debris and all the space objects. Uh, as I said, in case of risk de detection, there are the so-called collision avoidance maneuvers that are performed in order to move our satellite, if possible, and avoid the, the, the impact of the collision. For example, the International Space Station every year uh, reboost for uh, because uh, it, is, it is slowly uh, degrading its orbit, so it reboost. And uh, in case uh, of uh, risk of impact, the reboost is able to move this, the, the International Space Station far from the potential uh, collision. And when we say potential collision, we say uh, if an object is passing at less than 25 kilometers from the International Space Station, 25 kilometers is an emergency. In an emergency for uh, space debris. Uh, another technical solution is uh, to remove uh, satellites at the end of the operational life. As I said, uh, from Europe, uh, we shall remove uh, our uh, spacecraft uh, before 25 years after the end of their life. There are both uh, passive and active systems to remove uh, satellites. Uh, among the passive systems, there are the so-called drug sails that uh, use uh, the residual atmosphere at uh, high altitudes to slow down the satellite and make it the orbit. But sometimes this is not enough, so we have active systems such as electrodynamic tethers and the propulsion systems. Propulsion systems are employable at all altitudes and usually satellites that we launch are provided with propulsion systems that can be used at the end of, uh, of their life to remove the satellite. Here we have uh, uh, an example of a low-trust uh, propulsion system that was developed by a small enterprise that was born from Jesus a few years ago. Technology for Innovation uh, developed uh, this uh, regulus uh, low-trust uh, athletic propulsion uh, system and launched it on, on board of a satellite a few months ago to test it and enter in the field of uh, uh, space enterprises. Uh, another system that uh, I will not go into details about that are the electrodynamic tethers that uh, are uh, something really strange uh, considering it, it from, uh, from ground because uh, this uh, system uses the interaction with the Earth's magnetic field to the orbit the satellites. In this field, uh, the University of Padova and the CISAS is participating to the project ETIPAC that I mentioned in uh, the beginning of this presentation. Another important uh, way to mitigate debris collisions are, uh, is studying the effect of impacts because we want to create uh, new architectures that are resilient and that uh, may allow our satellites to survive from, uh, uh, after an impact. So there are two ways uh, to perform studies on uh, space uh, debris collisions. First uh, is doing uh, simulations. We use tools uh, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, part of use ANSYS Autodyne. These tools uh, are really good, but uh, usually require high computational uh, resources, uh, so, so much time to perform a simulation. So usually are limited to simplified uh, geometries. We also use impact test. And uh, this uh, impact test require, require dedicated facilities that uh, we can use to accelerate the projectiles to the high velocities that uh, we want to study. 
and this is uh, one of the topics uh, that we are discussing with uh, Dr. Badilado on uh, developing impact facilities. In general, uh, we can see that uh, these tests are important because uh, uh, we can uh, use them to create uh, uh, some data set and then extend them uh, with a simulation. And uh, in this way, uh, we can verify the response of a spacecraft in case of uh, uh, an impact. So in the last years, there is a growing interest in understanding also how the uh, satellites fragments in case of an impact. First, we studied just how to save it. Now we are also studying how it fragments in order to understand how the damages are propagated inside the spacecraft and uh, we'll chart the numbers uh, and uh, the size uh, and the shape of the debris that are generated from an impact. This uh, is a huge effort we are trying to develop that uh, requires uh, new simulation tools and dedicated facilities in order to investigate different uh, impact velocity ranges and uh, make many tests, many tests, and create a library of uh, information of uh, fragmentation data. Uh, in Padova, we have this uh, facility that uh, is uh, usually, uh, usually this kind of facility work in the range between two and six kilometers per second. Uh, some facilities go uh, over six kilometers per second, but they, uh, there are just a few of them. In Padova, we are able to reach uh, this limit uh, and launch projectiles up to 100 milligrams. We can uh, have a, a high shot frequency with uh, more than test, uh, 10 tests per day. We have a vacuum chamber, we can measure the velocity of the projectile and uh, add sensor to monitor what is happening to our targets. Our facility uh, is, uh, is, is used for many activities that we'll be, we will see later, uh, but uh, we are interested in uh, other velocities and other ranges for projectile masses. For this reason, we started a collaboration with Dr. Badilado here in MCAST because there is the interest in developing a new facility with a different range of impact velocities. From Padova, we have a certain heritage on this kind of activities. And uh, uh, we, in our collaboration, we, are, we have prepared already a preliminary design presented in uh, one uh, scientific paper, and the other two are going uh, on there in progress. In fact, uh, in Padova, we can reach, as I said, uh, high velocities up to six kilometers, and these are representative of impacts in the low Earth orbits. Our interest is to go to lower velocities, so uh, we want to replicate the impacts that happen in uh, the geostationary orbit. And uh, with the opportunity that we are creating with uh, Dr. Barilado, we, uh, we are thinking of the possibility to shot heavier projectiles in order to fragment larger targets and to simulate what could happen to a satellite that is uh, collided in uh, those orbits. Of course, uh, this kind of facility would be uh, employable also for uh, impacts uh, for aviation and uh, for defense applications. Uh, as I mentioned, a preliminary design was uh, uh, presented to uh, a congress that is organized every three years by the Italian Association of Aeronautics and Astronautics in order to show to the scientific community our advancements in uh, this field. Uh, and other works are in progress and we want to present them to the scientific community in order to have uh, good feedbacks about uh, this opportunity uh, in the next few months. Uh, another important topic in uh, developing strategies to mitigate the space debris is uh, studying advanced materials and advanced uh, structures. From the 60s, there was uh, this continuous effort in developing new shieldings and new protection for spacecraft. Here you can see uh, an example of the, evol of the evolution of shields from uh, the a monolithic piece of aluminum to the Whipple shield that was the first uh, suggested in the 40s to uh, the current solution that uh, is uh, the honeycomb panels that are used uh, also on ground. Uh, they are uh, panels made uh, with uh, two skins and an internal uh, uh, core of uh, honeycomb and uh, they have uh, a good uh, response to impacts, uh, both the hypervelocity and uh, high velocity. 
and their low mass helps protecting, uh, helps saving mass in uh, aerospace applications. Uh, with uh, our ground test, we can uh, verify new materials, we can uh, study new geometries, and we can validate uh, new manufacturing strategies. Uh, in the last years, uh, everyone is talking about additive manufacturing, uh, and also in the space community, we got uh, uh, the opportunity to study this uh, kind of technology advancement. Uh, because uh, with uh, add additive manufacturing, it is possible to create uh, complex uh, geometries, avoiding uh, uh, complex processes like gluing. So we can create uh, uh, panels like sandwich panels with just uh, one uh, one process. Process. We can create uh, smart components, components with embedded sensors, components that are optimized, and structures that are optimized to reduce mass and to improve their mounting and dismounting and going on. Uh, this is an important field because there are many potential applications of additive manufacturing also to the aviation field because the smart components can give a warning in case of wear or impelling failure and because this kind of components can help uh, for, uh, uh, for fast uh, substitution or for maintenance and this would be a huge asset for the, the aerospace community and in particular the aviation field. For this uh, argument, I didn't write it in the slide because uh, it is still not completely official but we are opening at CHISAS a uh, PhD position in the next few days for, uh, for a position for studying uh, smart uh, components and additive manufacturing for the aviation field. Uh, with uh, the University of Padova, we collaborated at uh, this Redshift program. Redshift uh, was a uh, funding by the European Commission and his goal was developing uh, innovative low-cost solution for spacecraft for space debris protection mitigation, for the design to demise the old satellites at their end of life, and for uh, testing new strategies and technologies such as additive manufacturing. In particular, in Padova, we test uh, some uh, 3D printed shields. We made uh, 20 shots uh, at different impact velocities with the different uh, projectiles. And uh, here I can show you some examples of the targets that we used. Uh, first, we use the simple plates to validate uh, the technology and uh, to assess if uh, it is, uh, we are able uh, to have a similar response than the mon monolithic uh, targets. And uh, the results were pretty good because uh, these uh, shields uh, are able to perform like uh, normal aluminum targets. On this basis, we studied uh, some uh, multi-layer configurations. Here you can see some videos of our impact studies. Uh, with these uh, new geometries, we were able to show improv improvements in terms of uh, debris shieldings. We compared our results with the standard protections, and we were able that we are uh, to, we were able to see that the number of uh, debris that are produced by an impact are are lower. So this kind of shields are quite interesting, and we are looking forward to new studies on uh, on this field. Another activity performed by Padova on uh, shields was with the Inbemus project. In this case, we investigated the, the behavior of uh, these panels that are multifunctional panels. They are made with the different uh, layers of uh, materials. Uh, these uh, panels have the huge adva uh, advancement that they are able to self-heal, so they can use the both in space and on ground uh, applications because, uh, for example, for tanks, they can be used for healing uh, the tanks in case of a damage. Uh, the investigations uh, in uh, this field were performed both with the testing in our facility and were also performed by uh, making SPH simulation with uh, Antis uh, Autodyne. Another activity that we performed was on composite panels. Here you can see some pictures on test on CFRP. Those activities were performed in collaboration of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. And also in this case, we were able to see that uh, this kind of panels fragments differently from uh, uh, aluminum panels. 
composite recently are uh, more used in uh, every kind of application. So understanding how can uh, they uh, how can they can break break up is important because uh, wearing uh, break up collisions may create different hazards with uh, respect to aluminum panels. Uh, it is important to discuss about technology transfer because. Uh, in general, all these uh, activities uh, related from the space sector are really employed in the everyday life. For example, the materials developed for space are uh, currently used uh, by all of us from scratch resistant uh, lens to memory forms. Everyone now is sleeping usually on memory form to advanced alloys for the aerospace uh, sector. But also technologies, I put as an example the LASIK that is used for ACE algae. Uh, the LASIK, uh, I know it because I went uh, under uh, this kind of surgery uh, for my eyes, and it comes from space applications. In particular, uh, space debris uh, research can generate a lot of solutions that are applicable to other fields. Uh, here, just for example, aviation and defense. From uh, these smart materials uh, to the, these uh, materials with the high resistance uh, to perforation uh, with the self healing properties to additive manufacturing to create uh, uh, systems that uh, have reduced maintenance and uh, can uh, simplify the access uh, or substitution. So now I'm quite at the end of this presentation. I will give you a fast overview of our research activities in CISAS. In CISAS, we uh, made, as I said, many hypervelocity impact testing. Uh, here there is uh, an overview of some of our tests. You can see the different materials and the instrumentation test. For example, we tested the tethers, we tested also ceramic forms and ice, ice for planetary protection, and we test also composite materials. Uh, mo most activities in the past, as I said, uh, included planetary protections and planetology because uh, this kind of facilities can be used also to study uh, impacts on uh, like of meteorites, meteorites uh, on uh, on ground, and uh, so the fields that are involved in impact testing are uh, very many, many, many fields. Uh, we tested, for example, space uh, space tethers. Uh, that is, uh, will be used uh, for, uh, uh, the, for the, the disposal of uh, satellites. Uh, with this, in our facility, we're able uh, to make uh, a huge number of tests. 24 tests is a, a huge effort. Uh, and also we expanded them with the numerical simulation. And uh, we understood how the tests respond to impacts. Because uh, tethers are really thin, uh, and we have to understand if uh, an impact with a space debris can cut it, uh, or if they can survive with just uh, minimal uh, damages. We also work on the simulations of uh, space impacts. Uh, as I said before, we use uh, mostly uh, ANSYS Autodyne to perform uh, simulations. But also, uh, ANSYS Autodyne has some limitations in uh, the computational uh, effort. For this reason, uh, in collaboration with the European Space Agency, we developed uh, the Collision Simulation Tool Solver that is a proprietary uh, software that uh, it is used to simulate complex scenarios that involve entire satellites. And we use, we use it to investigate how the satellites are fragmented and uh, uh, we try to produce statistically accurate results uh, that uh, can be used to estimate uh, the contamination of the space debris environment. Uh, I can show you some examples uh, of our application. I have to mention that uh, uh, the tool uh, is currently working, but uh, we are uh, uh, doing uh, more impact tests uh, to define and uh, to improve uh, our fragmentation models. Nowadays in Padova we are working on uh, materials uh, libraries, so testing different kinds of uh, materials. We have also to investigate uh, collisions with uh, larger targets and uh, larger projectiles. So for this reason uh, I, we are looking forward to the collaboration with MCAST because uh, this would give us the possibility to test uh, the impact uh, on uh, small satellite mockups uh, that uh, are quite important for developing our tool. Uh, here are some examples of the simulation we are able to perform. Here we performed the simulation of impact uh, in uh, the geostationary orbit. 
with the different impact conditions and with the low impact velocity. And we performed the uh, simulation on the potential fragmentation on the MVSAT uh, with uh, two kinds of impactors and the higher impact velocity because uh, with MVSAT we are at, on the low Earth orbits. Uh, an example of the results that we are able uh, to produce. Uh, this uh, work was uh, made in collaboration of the, uh, with the Politecnico di Milano. Uh, these are distribution of space debris in uh, the involved orbits, uh, and we saw that uh, the potential fragmentation on, uh, of MVSAT would cause a huge peak uh, of fragments uh, in the involved orbits. You can see that the peaks uh, change uh, dramatically, passing from uh, a low number to a pretty high number of uh, objects uh, that. Uh, may cause uh, uh, many hazards, hazards to the other satellite uh, in these orbits. Uh, also, uh, CISAS is involved in the development uh, of uh, a system for the orbiting for the ATPAC uh, project. We want uh, to create a deorbit kit uh, prototype uh, that will be launched in space in the next few years. The current project is limited to uh, developing the prototype. In these days, we are discussing the prosecution of this activity. Uh, there, is, uh, there will be uh, an official event at the next International Astronautical Congress in Dubai, in which uh, one uh, of the entities involved in this activity will uh, present the advancement uh, and a uh, potential launch date uh, for the ATPAC uh, uh, prototype that will be in uh, a couple of years. So we are looking forward to the IAC to uh, show to the scientific community that uh, tether systems are an important uh, solution to mitigate the space debris uh, problem. Uh, in the project uh, with the University of Padova, we developed uh, software and uh, systems to uh, deploy the space tether. Here I can show you a small video by, uh, on the ATPAC project. This video was produced by uh, our uh, collaboration, by, uh, by, by this scenario enterprise that is part of our consortium. Uh, of course, they are presenting the issue of space debris, and uh, with the TPAC, we want to address uh, this, uh, this issue. As uh, they are saying here, we want to uh, create uh, strategies and methods to the orbit uh, satellites because currently it is uh, uh, really complex. There are no uh, nice solutions to do it uh, cleanly and uh, fastly. And uh, with uh, ATPAC, uh, we want to present a solution uh, to all the stakeholders uh, to create this kit that can be bolted uh, on uh, the spacecraft and then the end of the life when the spacecraft uh, is dead. Uh, it will be able to stabilize the, spa the, scape, the spacecraft, to detangle it, to deploy this long tether that collecting uh, the electrons from the magnetosphere, create a current inside the tether, and uh, with this interaction with the magnetosphere, uh, it is able to slow down the, the satellite up to the re-entry in uh, Earth's atmosphere. And uh, to date, we are working to complete the activities uh, in a few months to reach a TRL4. And as I said, there are the going on projects for the launch of the uh, prototype in the next few years. To give you an example on, of what we are doing for ATPAC, uh, developing this kind of uh, technologies uh, requires the creation uh, and the validation of many building blocks, uh, building blocks technologies. One of them is the deployment of space tethers. Here we can see uh, an experiment that we made uh, on our glass table uh, in the University of Padova to simulate uh, the attitude of a module during the deployment uh, and uh, to test uh, the, uh, a deployment mechanism. Uh, this is a, a good advance that we made because uh, demonstrating the ability to deploy a long tether, also a short one in our equivalent experiment, is a huge result for the scientific community. So uh, we are at the end of uh, this presentation uh, with some conclusions. Uh, what uh, I hope, uh, some messages that I hope I passed you in this presentation are here listed. 
uh, I hope uh, that with this uh, seminar uh, now you have a better idea that on uh, this space debris problem because uh, as we said the near earth space is uh, really polluted there are a large numbers of artificial objects and most of them are uh, uncontrolled vehicles and they fragments uh, these are projects that are quite dangerous and we have to develop solution and mitigation strategies uh, from space debris tracking and space situational awareness, that is, uh, as I said, one of the trending topics in the last years, uh, to the removal of satellites after the end of life, another play, uh, field with many uh, opportunities uh, in, uh, also in the enterprise, for the enterprises. The ground testing that is fundamental to develop uh, advanced shields and investigate uh, how satellites fragment and the, the uh, utilization of novel materials and structures for spacecraft protection. I hope also that uh, another message uh, that passed was, uh, was about uh, the importance of ground facilities, because with our ground facilities uh, we can perform important investigation and modeling. For this reason we are really looking forward to the collaboration with MCAST, uh, and also I hope that the other important message is that uh, that passed is that the technologies and innovation can be easily transferred from the space sector to other fields such as aeronautics and defense. And now that I, I will conclude with a last remarks, a uh, few days ago uh, the University of Padova started the celebration of uh, its 800 years from uh, the foundation. The University of Padova was founded by a group of students that went away from Bologna and they wanted to create a good environment to uh, have freedom to learn what they want and to uh, grow as future experts and uh, going on with their careers. This was 800 years ago. Now we started these celebrations with a huge event in Padova and uh, one message that uh, was passed in uh, this uh, ceremony is that uh, 800 years are really uh, uh, a long life for our university but we do not we have not to stop uh, and uh, lie on our successes but uh, we have to keep working to improve uh, and uh, we do not we shall not uh, create walls uh, with, uh, but create bridges uh, with other entities, with other institutions, in order to uh, enlarge our uh, academics and uh, our research and uh, collaborate with, uh, with uh, all the community, because only through collaborating we can uh, go on with uh, the success of this uh, university. So for this reason, I'm really happy to be here, I'm really honored to be here and I hope you appreciated this lecture and I'm looking forward for future collaboration with the MCAST. Of course, now I'm available for any question from the audience and I thank you for your attention. and uh, introduction to the activities we are uh, doing uh, here uh, at MCAST with the new space program. One thing I would like to say about uh, Dr. Olivier uh, is that uh, in uh, the academic life, uh, uh, also when you are in the industry, it's important uh, to have a connection with uh, people that can speak uh, the same or same language. Why? Because uh, this uh, boost is uh, uh, boost a lot uh, the, the level of the research that you can uh, carry out. And I'm proud to say that uh, with uh, Lorenzo, in a 10 minutes chat, uh, we can uh, uh, accomplish a lot of work. And uh, uh, so, this uh, input uh, for uh, the students here. Is uh, very important uh, to develop uh, also the support of soft skills uh, and the way in which you communicate uh, technical knowledge uh, with other people this in the academic environment uh, and uh, the, in the industry environment. I forgot also to say this is uh, an extra info that uh, Dr. Rivier was also a victim of curling <laughs> many, many years ago, but I say this just for the record. <laughs> And also to, to 
to say that uh, uh, you, uh, the project that you are getting us really looking for the, for uh, these, uh, these new projects. And uh, next week, uh, um, I'm not very confident to say that I will represent uh, ANCAST, and I will be with uh, uh, Dr. Rigay, Professor Francesconi at the AJC, International Aeronautical Congress in Dubai, and there will be a great opportunity for ANCAST to put a first step uh, in, uh, in this field. Last comment before uh, taking some questions is that an uh, important message that uh, was presented today is the concept uh, of uh, knowledge transfer. So, what you show here applied uh, to a space that is no more so far from us, from our daily life these many years, is about all the technologies uh, that uh, we use every day, but also here for the students of aviation, not the technologies that uh, from the pure space applications, so in orbit and the orbit, are applied to the aviation sector and the aeronautical sector. And uh, it is uh, a field evolving uh, a lot. And uh, what uh, today is presented uh, like uh, a cutting edge technology, something uh, super advanced, in uh, five, ten years uh, will be something uh, normal. Just uh, like having a GPS receiver now, a smartphone or a touch screen. So, this is something very important that uh, you, will, uh, you will find uh, along your professional route. Now, are there any questions? I'm sure, Stephen has a <laughs> for sure. Okay. Thank you for being here. It was very interesting. I have two questions actually, which I can put together. The first one you mentioned is the Janus mission to Jupiter and to the moons. And there was one day because I was reading about it, it has been a really long time, but if they were real and they were spied on it, on the moons, like they were all maybe up to 10 years or I don't know. The other question is about the protection from the view. And there was one day why maybe, or if there is research ongoing, collective systems on large structures like the space stations. Protection is a laser beam, for example, to recognize debris, small debris, instead of you operating the space station and moving it every time. Um, because this also depends defends, um, um, like, uh, you know, tanks. So they're looking at the moment and they get protection system against projectiles. So maybe there was one thing if there is such a piece of jump going in the space. Well, uh, starting from the first question, uh, in Padova we de developed the part of the Janus telescope. Uh, I have to correct myself a little bit. Janus is part of the Jewish mission, Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jupiter Icy Moon mission that is uh, in, uh, currently going on by ESA. It will launch the, with the, the next uh, launch uh, opportunity, I think, next year, if everything will work uh, smoothly. And uh, JUICE uh, is the first, uh, the second mission, I think, from uh, ESA on uh, Jupiter. Uh, and it will, it will focus uh, uh, just uh, on uh, exploring uh, the icy moon from space. So the, with all the instrumentation, the scientists will be able to uh, understand the internal compositions of the moons, the magnetic field around them, uh, the possibility of... Uh, uh, well, we know that there are oceans inside, uh, under the ice of the icy moons. How uh, deep are those oceans? Is there the possibility that uh, there is life inside, uh, inside them? This can be studied through uh, space observations from, uh, from this mission. Also, the mission will try to collect uh, data from uh, the geysers that are uh, ejecting materials in space. So uh, this will allow us to, uh, to study in deep uh, what, uh, what there is on Europa and uh, on the icy moons. With respect to the, land, the, the, the landers, uh, uh, currently, there is uh, no active mission that uh, will have uh, a lander, but uh, NASA is uh, developing the main technologies for the lander. Some of those technologies are also in collaboration with uh, Europe, with uh, DLR, 
Uh, I got the opportunity some years ago at the uh, uh, past IAC to discuss it with uh, an expert from the LR. Uh, because it is not so easy to, to create a lender to go to the icy moon and then to uh, perforate the ice uh, for like 10 kilometers and then reach the ocean below it. Uh, it requires the development of many building uh, blocks, building technologies that will allow it. Uh, NASA is thinking about uh, the half of the 30s uh, to launch this uh, kind of mission. Before realizing, uh, before building that kind of mission, we will need some uh, equivalent demonstration mission. For example, on uh, in uh, in the South Pole, there are some deep lakes uh, under the ice, and uh, this will be a good opportunity to test the technologies to perf perforate the ice and uh, reach the the lakes below it, and test all the technologies that will be launched in the future. I say the 30s, it seems very far from here, but for a space mission, the 30s is quite close. Uh, it will be a huge advancement for the research of life uh, in space. Uh, with respect to the second question... Uh, active protection systems. Active protection systems. Active protection systems. Uh, space, uh, space, Yes, this is really, really, really complex for two reasons. The first reason is that space debris are really fast. We speak about, in, in GEO it might be possible, in LEO, we, we, in low Earth orbits, we speak with velo of velocities up to 16 kilometers per second. Uh, so uh, the, the, the time that we will have to destroy the, the impacting projectile, the impacting debris, is uh, really short. So you will require a huge amount of energy to destroy it. Uh, uh, it would be also dangerous for uh, potential satellites in the line of sight of your uh, system. The other issue is uh, related to the tracking, because you don't know the smallest, uh, the smallest uh, de uh, debris, you don't know where they are, they just arrive. Uh, you can protect for the larger one, you can think of system to remove in the larger one. One idea was to build uh, the Ion Shepard, it was called, it was proposed by Madrid, the University of Madrid. That was a system that with ions would slow down uh, huge debris and make them deorbit. But uh, you need a spacecraft to arrive in proximity and uh, use uh, this uh, application system to hit uh, the debris with uh, ions. Someone is thinking about lasers, ground-based lasers, to uh, vaporize uh, space debris. This is also really complex because uh, uh, from Earth we have the problem of the atmosphere that would deviate a little bit, that would change the, the direction of the light, the, of the laser, to, uh, before it would hit the, 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 the debris. Uh, it would be nice to put it uh, uh, in space. Uh, in space there is the, the problem that you need a lot of energy, so a uh, huge number of solar panels. So uh, there are ideas, but they are really complex. This is the uh, future technologies, uh, they are not in my field. I, uh, something is going on, but uh, not in the short time. The, of course, as I said before, when there are needs, there are opportunities. So maybe if someone is having a really good idea, this could be the, one of the solutions for the space debris mitigation. Thank you. So, other questions? I would like to hear some questions from uh, the students. Since there is this opportunity, one, two, three. So, let's give a first. Uh, about materials that they can withstand the impact of the debris. Uh, I don't know if it would be possible uh, to send uh, like, like a satellite beam, let's say, because 
have tested materials, probably we will reach the level to find the material which will be able to withstand, just to withstand the impact. So, as we heard also that there are debris that we cannot track the smaller debris. So, for this, I suppose if it would be a satellite or more satellites than one, of course, uh, go against the orbit of the debris to collect, let's say, the smaller particles. So, because of the moon, as we cannot track them, we cannot uh, control the debris for sure. But if we would be able to, to, to collect them, like a huge beam, mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be valuable for our, for our clearance above the Earth orbit. Uh, I don't know if it is possible to happen something like this, and if it is possible, these are the difficulties, and has it developed something like this? Okay, uh, first, uh, every question is a good question. Just uh, if you make a question, I appreciate it, uh, and uh, this is particularly a good question. Because uh, you are not the first one thinking about that, uh, it is complex again. Uh, today I am saying too much times. So this is complex, but uh, yes, uh, uh, there are those ideas. Uh, the big issue of uh, space uh, is that uh, there are larger. It's an enormous volume of uh, empty space. Uh, with uh, there are many debris, but uh, the density is uh, small. So you will need a large, large spacecraft to, or system of spacecraft to clean, to sweep the whole orbits. The idea is good, but the, the concepts are of not using a spacecraft, but some kind of nets, because launching in space is expensive, so you have to use as low mass as possible. So uh, collecting the debris with a, a large net could be a solution. What uh, it should be analyzed is that uh, if the debris is going in the same direction of you, you are able to collect it. With the debris that are impacting against you, you have uh, huge velocities, you can reach 16 kilometers per second. So there is always the possibility to perforate uh, the net. So this is the, the uh, biggest constraint of, on this kind of technology. But of course, uh, there are ideas on trying to sweep them, the, 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 the space, uh, mostly for the largest fragments, uh, because they, they are dangerous, uh, not only because they are larger, because luckily we can track them, but because they are uncontrolled, uh, and they can fragment more in smaller fragments. So the best way to address uh, this uh, issue nowadays uh, is not trying to remove all the small one, but to remove the larger one before they fragment. In this way, the smaller one, yes, they are still dangerous, but slowly they will reduce in number, they will re-enter, they, they will reach less dangerous orbits, and the problem will be partially solved. So let's try to collect the larger one with, for example, nets, active debris removal strategies, and going on, and let's remove all the other satellites. So you've already something uh, which is uh, scheduled to happen. Yes. Uh, uh, they are assessing the solutions with, uh, with nets. They are just assessing. Uh, there are some presentation uh, usually on the IAC and International Astronomical Congress on this topic. Uh, they are studying it, uh, but uh, no real space mission for the smaller debris is uh, is launched. Is uh, is currently currently planned. They are they are only planning the removal of the larger debris. So, I just mentioned the smaller part. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is the huge problem. We cannot see them, we cannot track them, and uh, it is uh, complex to remove them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, for a lot of ideas, I'm uh, thinking that uh, maybe tomorrow for my students on the second year, there will be a little uh, uh, extra with uh, an eye on the future about uh, materials you can encounter, not today, not tomorrow, but in like three, five, eight, ten years in uh, the aviation sector. So it can be, if, uh, don't worry, really get it. <laughs>
will be available yes. now. We'll ask him to do an extra during the lesson of tomorrow. So this will be a seed, we're not to be asked for the exam, so don't worry. But uh, I think it's a very good opportunity to see something uh, extremely cutting edge, state of the art, uh, super new today. But since uh, you are uh, very young and uh, to develop properly your profession will take years, uh, at least uh, you will already have a little uh, insight uh, of what is going on uh, on the most uh, advanced uh, studies about it. So she let us a little extra. So, a person here? The little. Yes, sir. I Basically, my question was very similar to Lingas, um, but I was thinking about respondent dates and uh, as usual, 75 kilojoules is a lot of energy, and imagine that I think um, astronauts, for example, going up uh, in space, uh, that would be uh, a disaster. And the problem is, uh, by time, there are more dead dates. So we have to take care of it. And uh, somebody, you, there are, there is research and there is uh, something is developing about that. My other question was a little bit legal, maybe you can answer me, maybe not. And in my opinion, I don't know, but it took five years to remove um, a satellite after it, uh, the mission is over. I'm seeing it too long. I don't know if you can answer me, just not in your area, but for me, I think it's too long. Yes, yes, I totally understand uh, your question. Uh, 25 years seems uh, a long time. Uh, yes, uh, 25 years, everything can change. But uh, uh, allowing a satellite to be removed to, to the orbit in 25 years, it means that you put on uh, that you put your satellite in a low Earth orbit, a really low orbit, so with the residual atmosphere it will uh, go away, or, or you put uh, some deorbiting device on it. So uh, for the satellites that will uh, decay naturally in uh, 25 years, uh, they are not uh, in, in orbits that are not really polluted, so they are not a real hazard, so uh, they can stay, stay for 25 years, they are not dangerous. For the other satellites, uh, the 25 year rules uh, impl imply that uh, the provider of the satellite, uh, the owner, should move the satellite from the hazard orbit to the non hazard ones. So, for this reason, 25 years is okay because uh, it will remove the satellite from the most dangerous uh, conditions. Uh, these numbers were developed in many years by the expert in mitigation at the IADC. And uh, this is the main reason be behind that. Of course, uh, there are other orbits in which it's not possible to uh, remove in 25 years a satellite. For example, in just a scenario orbit, uh, it's too expensive to apply the 25 years uh, rule. In this case, uh, the satellites are moved in on higher orbits, uh, the, that are, they are called cemetery orbits, uh, and in that orbits, they will not cause any problem at all for the next uh, few thousands of years. We will see in 1,000 years, if there will be a problem, it will be, not be our problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rodriguez was mentioning they support the radial orbits. Nowadays, uh, roughly after 60, years of uh, space uh, era, things are still manageable, but uh, we were this uh, new space economy, uh, this new race uh, to also from the private sector, we can't really know in 50 years uh, how it will be and access to space uh, and uh, stratospheric flight, uh, new rich people that we can fly now, uh, at least support it. Uh, we don't know how much this will go, so we don't know still the repercussions. So it's uh, a really fast uh, developing uh, field. So, no, no, so one. I would like to ask you if there's any uh, research going on prevention or at least minimizing hitting those, uh, those ingredients for the, for the 
the satellites. What I mean by artificial, by, uh, by intelligent software estimating those objects to get the, to the, to the satellites. So we will minimize either by maneuvering the satellites using thrusters or something like, like that to, uh, to minimize, prevent or minimize those uh, hanging the, the satellites. Rather than to only solve the problem after hitting them, we will try to uh, prevent or minimize those things. Yes, this is uh, the motivation behind all the space surveillance. The, in the beginning, it was just uh, checking uh, enemy satellites, because uh, in the Cold War, uh, space surveillance was born from the US to check uh, the, so the, the Soviets and uh, for the Soviets to check the US. Uh, then uh, it uh, evolved in uh, checking dangerous uh, objects that would uh, reduce uh, the military power of uh, both uh, nations. And now it is uh, just uh, assessing the space debris environment. Of course, there is also the military side of that. It's still there. But uh, uh, going to the heart of your question, uh, yes, all the space surveillance has this objective uh, to uh, avoid as much as possible the collisions. So there, are, there is a lot of modeling from, uh, from the ground. For example, the collision between the Iridium and the Cosmos was uh, there was a scientist that uh, told the community, yes, it will happen, sooner or later it will happen, and nobody was believing him. After the collision, they started believing in him. Uh, so uh, the scientific community was not ready at the beginning. Now there is uh, this effort to uh, develop strategies to avoid as much as possible collisions. And uh, uh, this is, uh, in the last few years, this is uh, a real trending topic in, uh, in this field because uh, we need uh, a lot of observations, we need uh, a lot of uh, calculations to propagate orbits in order to know as soon as possible if there is any potential collision and to move the satellites. But with a huge number of satellites launched, for example, for larger constellations, we shall avoid to move the satellite in, a, in an orbit in which it can become an hazard for a, another satellite. Another thing that is important is uh, to create uh, a backbone to uh, allow all providers to communicate and share information. Because if I uh, found that uh, a satellite is going to impact me, I have to reach the provider and tell him, you have to move your satellite because maybe I cannot move my satellite. You have to move your object to avoid hitting me. And uh, usually uh, it is really complex to have these, these discussions. For this region, the space situational awareness uh, initiatives are trying to create all a, a shared system with a shared uh, information and the procedures to uh, improve the collision avoidance. And also, uh, there are studies uh, in order to apply artificial int intelligence uh, to create networks uh, that are able to prevent uh, automatically all the collisions. Thank you very much. There are very interesting questions. I don't know if there are others. Can you please uh, know Dr. Olivier? I think there's a question over there. Where is it? Oh, okay, perfect. And it's also saying it would be available if someone is shy, if you can uh, just uh, uh, go to meet him and ask, so don't, uh, no worries. Hello, um, I don't know if the space is this, and I think if so, maybe it can be satellite or something, and, and it's very complete and maybe um, minimize the speed of the debris coming towards it. I don't know. Well, uh... You are not the first to, to ask this question. Every time there is someone asking this question, because it would be really simple to attract the space debris. Unfortunately, space debris are made uh, mostly in aluminum and nowadays in uh, carbon fibers. So there, there is no possibility to use magnetic field to capture the debris. Uh, usually you try not to put too much uh, magnetic materials on a satellite 
because it would interact uh, with the magnetic uh, field of the Earth uh, and this uh, would affect uh, the attitude control. In fact, uh, in the last years, uh, the, they are uh, discussing to add uh, a ferromagnetic uh, plate uh, on a uh, fixed interface uh, on a spacecraft in order to improve uh, the capability of uh, potential uh, space tags uh, to capture them uh, and remove them. So you just put uh, one piece of uh, ferromagnetic material in order to be able to capture it uh, with uh, less uh, effort. And this is the only thing we can do with uh, magnetic systems, because uh, everything is aluminum, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to see this uh, interesting, because of course it's a uh, power field uh, Expertise. One thing I'd like to uh, to remark once again, and this is more for uh, uh, colleagues and uh, the management, is uh, uh, the interest from uh, the researchers and uh, the professional guests that uh, we saw last week, but it's also the interest uh, as the University of Padua of uh, opening this uh, uh, channel of communication to Vernas. One proof is uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, Dr. Olivieri is very much uh, thanks uh, to funds of the project in Padua. And also, uh, you will see here in the spring, uh, Professor Francesco will be here. And uh, there are, this is a joint collaboration, so there are the funds thanks to MCSD, so Malta, plus the support uh, of uh, the University of Padua itself. And I think that. Uh, for us, uh, is uh, a very important uh, milestone, uh, and uh, uh, I see it, uh, it growing. Uh, and there are already a lot of things uh, going on behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, this is a professor that uh, will present the results. Uh, we don't uh, market too much uh, before we are happy to see the, the results. So thank you once again. And uh, now there is a uh, want uh, a coffee. For the next lessons, uh, and uh, probably that is available if you want uh, to ask any questions. So, thank you once again. Thank you to all of you.